Hi, this is Abdul Bharti and welcome to another episode of TFR Insights. And today we have with us Michelle McLean, VP of Marketing at StackRox. Michelle, it's good to see you again, though we are not in, <laughs> seeing each other in person as we used to see in the past because of this pandemic, but it's really good to see you. It's lovely to be with you again. Thank you so much. Uh, it's amazing what we've been able to turn into virtual exercises. If I'm not wrong, recently you published a, a white paper around the container maturity. I want to know, I mean, I have read it, but I want to know what were some of the key highlights of the paper. So what we set out to do in defining this container security maturity model was help people through thinking through the journey. Everybody's going through a very similar process of adopting containers and Kubernetes into their environment to accelerate application development, enable greater flexibility, be able to move environments between on-prem and cloud and you know this cloud or that cloud they're on two simultaneous learning curves right they're having to learn about containers and kubernetes at the same time that they're having to learn about how to secure containers and kubernetes and so what we set out to do in this maturity model was kind of chart that path for them give them a vision of what would be coming so that they could think ahead and not get caught short if you think about security traditional infrastructure, it was very much a waterfall exercise. I'm going to code, then I'm going to throw it over to ops, and right before ops is going to deploy it, they're going to have security to do a last minute check on it. That doesn't work in today's cloud native infrastructure. We really need to be doing security along the way. And so what we set out to do with this maturity model was just help them think ahead, help them get ahead, and help them anticipate how their security requirements would change as they progress through this adoption curve for containers and Kubernetes. Right, and if I'm not wrong, you also mentioned uh, the five stages of container maturity. Can you just talk about, you know, briefly about each, each stage? Sure, absolutely. So stage one, we really call sort of an individual initiatives, and it's really a developer a little bit playing around, right? Learning the technology, doing stuff on their personal laptop, that kind of idea. In stage two, we move into an official project. We've maybe taken a piece of an existing app that we're going to move into containers and microservices, or even maybe a, a new app that's um, maybe smaller in scope, and organization is now working on it. So you have more people involved, you start to care about security. You know, in the first stage, you don't care too much about security, to be honest, because nothing's at risk. But once you get into an official project, you need to have a few things in place. You need some image scanning, you're going to start to think about vulnerability management, that kind of thing. Stage three is really where we think about that first initial microservice or app moving into production. And now the table stakes are a little higher, right? Now we really need to be thinking about much more robust controls, maybe separation, making sure nothing else can touch this app, right? So we're segmenting out um, the assets associated with this app. We might start to care a lot more about compliance when we're in, in uh, production. And we're probably going to care about security at runtime which maybe in the earlier phases we didn't. Stage four, we really think about expansion. Most of the new apps that we're building, we're going to do in containers and microservices and run them through Kubernetes. And so here, shift in security really starts to be one of automation, of scale, there's more complexity you've got to manage because now you've got multiple apps. And so that segmentation, all those policies get a little more sophisticated. And then stage five, where we're really at sort of organization-wide adoption of containers, now you're probably augmenting the infrastructure. It's not just containers and Kubernetes, but likely there's a service mesh, maybe Istio is in the mix. Um, you need to be aware of the new threat vectors that, is, that surface when you are augmenting the infrastructure this way, and you need to protect those new layers of the infrastructure as well. Now, you also uh, early, earlier mentioned that, you know, uh, security is no longer an afterthought. Earlier, you know, developers will not even consider that it was silos. Uh, but today, uh, there's a lot of awareness. A lot of companies are, you know, looking at security as the very first step. We look at DevSecOps. Can you talk a bit about what led to this, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, change in mindset or approach towards security, where security is one of the primary factors today, instead of being something which was an afterthought. I think that it's, I think that there are two dynamics at play. One is pace, and one is what we're able to do. So I'll talk about pace first. Business success today, business innovation today, is entirely rooted in how your customers perceive you through their applications. 
So people understand that app innovation and lighting customers with their interface with these customers through the application is essential to success. And so the pace of iteration is much faster. If you're not building in cloud native technology, you're not going to persist as a business. And so everybody's running at this faster speed. And so the recognition came in that this waterfall approach was never going to be able to keep up in this infrastructure. And you cannot have fast innovation, fast iteration, and just leave security behind. It's not an option. You can't simultaneously strengthen your corporate chance at success through app innovation, but then compromise that chance at success by leaving your business exposed. So recognition was at this faster app dev pace, we need security to be along for the ride. So that's kind of the challenge of it all. The opportunity of it all, the big upside of it all is these new abilities. This infrastructure, containers and Kubernetes, have attributes that can help us build the most secure apps we've ever built. This infrastructure is meant to be immutable. In other words, it should not change. And so when you know it should not change, and something in your system perceives a change, then you can assume that's bad. You can be more sure of something being wrong when you know you have immutable infrastructure. It's also ephemeral infrastructure, which makes it challenging, like what happened, right? It, it, you know, after the fact, forensics can be a little bit harder. That ephemeral nature is tied into the automation at the orchestration layer. So if there's a problem with an asset, build the asset and restart it. No problem. Your app will, will keep running. We can take advantage of that in, in a security co construct, say, there's immutability. We can be sure that that change is bad. There's also declarative data. This infrastructure says what it's supposed to be doing. And so if we see a disparity between what it says it's supposed to be doing and what we observe it to be doing, we can also assume that's bad. We can use that declarative data to have a much more robust understanding of security in this environment. And I'll give you one tangible example. We used to think a lot about risk from the standpoint of vulnerabilities. If I have a vulnerability and it's got a high CVSS score, that's a bad thing and that needs to be rooted out and that's my priority. What we understand now is that vulnerabilities are not all the same. Vulnerabilities are not all that contributes to risk. If I have a problem in an asset that is customer facing, open to the internet, stores financial data and stores customer data, that is way more important to me. Protecting that whole suite of services and assets delivering that application is way more important to me than protecting an internal, test only never gets out of dev kind of application, right? And so I can take that declarative data, use the, use the rich context that Kubernetes provides, and now have a much better understanding of risk in my environment, focus my resources on those risk factors that really could compromise me as a business versus, you know, I can get to it later, or frankly, it's unimportant if I ever fix that vulnerability. And I would point to something like the Equifax breach. It's a great example of this. The Equifax breach was rooted in a construct called Struts. And the Equifax team knew Struts was a problem. Everybody in the industry knew Struts was a problem by now. They had a punch list of environments to work through, get Struts out of the picture. They just hadn't gotten to that one yet. And so had they had the ability to marry all that context information with knowledge that struts was running, then they could have said, oh, this one, let's go fix this environment first and potentially could have prevented such a such an, um, um, widespread breach. So that's an example of while there are challenges in securing containers in Kubernetes, there are also many attributes, primarily the, the declarative data, the declarative data and the immutable nature of them that make this the most secure apps we could ever build. So it's, it's a very exciting time to be working in security. If we compare it with the traditional you know, IT infrastructure, it's quite different. You know, The challenges that are there in the cloud and cloud native worlds when it comes to security is totally different from 
the traditional landscape. At the same time, because of the COVID-19, a lot of businesses, they are moving a lot of operations online, which were never supposed to be on the cloud. At the same time, there are a lot of users who, I mean, I can think of elderly users, you know, population, which used to go to bank, physical bank, or go to the doctors. Now they are doing a lot of things online. So the risk factor, the, you know, attack vector is also increasing. So talk about the, the what unique challenges this Kubernetes or cloud or container poses in the context of security, which was not seen in the traditional IT? I think what you find is that you're absolutely right about this adoption curve and companies, you know, that that's a great motivator for us talking about this whole security maturity model, because again, people are having to learn both the infrastructure and the security for that infrastructure at the same time. Everyone's on that same learning curve. And the path is really new for, for so many people. So, you know, things that have changed are layers in the infrastructure are new and need to be secured and the scope. We're seeing so many people, like you're saying, migrating much faster to SaaS-based operations or cloud-based services. And so what we find is that businesses are increasingly looking to offload whatever they can. So we see this big adoption of since in the Kubernetes world, you see a big adoption of managed Kubernetes services. If you were getting started with Kubernetes a few years ago, you probably managed it yourself. You ran all the control plane as well as the worker nodes yourself. Now we see massive adoption of services like Amazon EKS, Azure AKS, Google GKE. These are managed Kubernetes services because the business has so much to do. You talked about migrating to these apps really fast in, in a time of COVID, you want to offload their stuff as much as possible. So using a managed service lets, lets you do that. At the same time, if you can offload some of the thinking of how to do security, what does good look like? What does safe look like? If you can adopt some platform tools that really help you get out of the box policies and get you further along, in securing your infrastructure without you having to go through this massive learning curve yourself? Like why reinvent the wheel? So we're seeing uptake at the same time of managed services and augmenting with security platforms so that they can focus on what they need to do as a business, and get this, you know, burden, if you will, um, of sort of known information that's more turn the crank. Like let's just apply what's already known our own infrastructure so that we can get further down our journey and focus on the parts that are unique to our business versus the stuff where we can just leverage a lot of industry known best practice. Though the things are improving, companies are getting you know better at security, but where are most companies in their you know journey to 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 be fully? I mean, you can never be fully secure, but still, uh, how many are at different phases of you know uh, security from from your perspective? Yes. What we see a tremendous amount is as much as we have the opportunity to do security at the same time as we're building this infrastructure, there is still usually a little bit of a gap. And it's because maybe it started over here in a pocket of developers and it's just migrating across uh, the broader set of the organization now. So we do see people pretty early in the journey in terms of the the phases that I outlined to you at the beginning, most people are in, you know, stages two and three for the most part, right? So there's some sort of sanctioned project. It's not very widespread yet. And maybe they're just about to move into prod. I'll be honest. We talk to people all the time who are a little sheepish, a little embarrassed, say, yeah, we, we've got this one app. It's running in prod and we don't have any security yet. Sometimes not even any vuln scanning yet can sometimes just be included with your cloud provider service, right? So we definitely see people still in a bit of catch-up mode with, with security. And there's a couple of challenges. The infrastructure is driven on the DevOps side and classic security knowledge hasn't resided there. And so organizations are looking to get those teams a little more educated about security and um, learning what are the native features that they could use to apply security. There's a lot of really fantastic native controls in, in Kubernetes, for example, admission controllers, what's safe to start running on the, on the system, uh, network segmentation, what should talk to what. None of these security features is enabled by default. 
and we're helping organizations, you know, understand what is safe, what is good, what is best practice, how to set those guardrails, and then have the developers live within those guardrails to keep moving application innovation along. But it's, we see plenty of people for whom uh, security is still a bit of a catch-up game. And it's also like, it's twofold. One is a uh, uh, tech, tech solution that you can bring as many tech solutions as you want, but there is all, second is, education and mindset or people, you know, issue as well, you have to. So how much role does that play uh, education and uh, what is TechStruck doing? I mean, of course you have awesome technologies there, but what to do with the people part of the problem? Yes, absolutely the case. Um, and what we're seeing is that organizations that are empowering their developers to be more full stack responsible are in the end, enabling a far more robust skill set in their environment. So where we tend to help is um, we have a tremendous amount of just educational materials that have nothing to do with the Stackrocks platform. So, you know, education materials around how to configure Kube appropriately, how to harden Docker effectively, what are some of the security best practices in all these managed Kubernetes services like EKS, AKS, VKE. We've done extensive research, hands-on research to say, look, when you're going through this process of setting this up, Turn this on, set this flag, enable this because it's not by default. And so all of that is external to the Stackrocks platform and external to our tooling. But that education is really essential and people are very hungry for it because it's not obvious. And again, nothing's on by default. And so they have to uh, have to apply these across their environment to get to a better baseline of security. We talked about all the you know the challenges, the problems, how you know different companies are different stages. Uh, now we talked a lot about the problem. Let's talk about the solution side. You did touch upon a lot of things, but let's talk about. The, I mean, I have talked to Stack Rocks you know a couple of times, so I do know what you guys are doing there. But talk a bit about you know how are you kind of you know helping these companies to kind of tackle these this problem? What kind of technologies, solutions, projects you have there? I, and I think it really taps into some of these trends that we've been talking about, right? That we have the potential in this infrastructure to build really secure applications. And the thing that I think sets Stackrocks apart is that we've really the, uh, honed in on those native capabilities. So Stackrocks is the only platform, container security platform out there that takes a Kube native approach securing the environment. And what we mean by that is that we integrate deeply with, with Kubernetes. So we're pulling in context that I was talking about, that declarative data. Is it open to the internet? Is this an important app? Um, is it, uh, you know, are there budgy processes that are running here? We take all that context and really enrich the customer's view of what's happening in that environment. And then at the same time, we push the policies. So I talked about people not wanting to reinvent the wheel, leverage best practice. We build that into the policies, dozens and dozens of policies that are built into our platform. Those policies though, enforced, we push that right back into Kubernetes. Kubernetes is incredibly capable. What can be deployed? What should talk to what? But we tap into native controls in Kubernetes, things like network segmentation and admission control, for Kubernetes to do the enforcement. And so as a result, the organization gets one universal source of truth across infrastructure and security about what's going on. And all the policies live there. There's one view of reality. You don't have a control plane separate from the infrastructure plane that's like, you know, taking action on that infrastructure in a way that's invisible. The DevOps team, that's not what we do. Everything's embedded at the Kubernetes layer. So infrastructure, security, they're on the same page. They see the same worldview and it enables security that's really built in, not bolted on. And that helps organizations fundamentally operationalize security at scale. Awesome. Michelle, thank you so much for uh, taking time out and talking to me today. And as I said, you know, there's security is really, you know, you know, inter not interesting, but critical topic for today's, you know, word. So I look forward to talk to you again. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure to be with you.